Pastor Sean preached on the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Yeah. And I prophesied over Sean, and I didn't even know, I, I, nothing, all week I've never thought about it, or the week before, nothing. But at that moment in church, God says to me, go and tell him he's a cornerstone. And I've never heard that before. I've never heard, but if Jesus is the chief cornerstone, there must be others. It also says Jesus is the good shepherd. There must be some bad ones. <laughs> I mean, there must be some others. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. So it talks about the cornerstone. Now, where's my piece of paper? I thought about this. I thought, if God's given us a cornerstone who serves the chief cornerstone, then he must want to build something here. You know, don't get a cornerstone unless you're going to build something. And we're building something here. <coughs> and something that will last. Not a five-minute wonder, but something that will last in this place. Not saying this place, I'm talking about crew and surrounding areas. So he wants us to build. And it's time to build. Is you in or is you out? Oh, she's in. I'm in. <laughs> you know, you've got to think to yourself, am I in or am I out? Because I'm God in. is wanting to build something. I'm gonna I'm gonna minister this morning out of Nehemiah. And Lynn's gonna, in a moment, Lynn's gonna give you a, I've got a map of the gates and the walls in Jerusalem. And you can see, I, I believe there was 10 gates. Some people say there was 12. Don't really matter. I've got 10 on the paper I've got. 13. Have we, have, we got, have we got one in muzzle? <laughs> sure, keep the kids quiet. <laughs> First Corinthians 2.16 says, We, we, if you've given your life to Christ today, we have the mind of Christ. Because people tell me certain things, oh, well, that's my culture, or that's the way I am, or that's this, or that. No, no, we have the mind of Christ. Oh, well, he don't talk to me. Well, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. So are you not one of his sheep? If you're here today and you're not one of Jesus' sheep, you're going to be by the time you leave. Amen? Amen. Good. Let's get rid of that. I thought about something, and I thought about this asking you a question. If we're building something, are you a pioneer or are you a settler? I'll explain that. Pioneers go and do something for God. Settlers say, we're all right as we are, thank you. We like it as we are. And that's why a lot of the churches are dying. That's why a lot of the churches, when they get to a certain age, they all die and the church closes. That's not a criticism because those churches in their in their day were awesome. They were fantastic. When we were in the States, we had revival breakout and we went to the back, big Baptist church in, in San Antonio and there was 25,000 members there. And I said to the lady who was on reception, I said, we, we've got revival at our church at the moment. She said, we had one of them in 1983. And I'm thinking, yeah, see, we, we, you know, we're going to sit on what we've got. We don't want to sit on what we've got. We want more. This place is far too small. And because we want to see people come to Christ. We want to see people living in the reality of Jesus Christ. Amen? And then I, I, just, I, I did this years ago, but it's like a, a difference between a pioneer and a settler. Pioneers believe this. Constant change is here to stay. Change is the essence of organic growth. Oh, but we do, you know, we don't, oh, we've always done it like that. And we always want to do it like that. No. Settlers say this, always counting and generally resisting change. They're the settlers who, we're all right as we are, thank you. We're not all right as we are. We're not all right as we are here. We've got to grow. If you don't grow, if a baby don't grow, what is it? Baby. It's a freak. <laughs> or it's a dwarf. You know, we don't want to walk churches. We want churches that are full of people who love God. They'll come down on you a bit heavy in a minute. Hmm. Number two, daily pioneers, daily giving themselves to God in total abandonment 
utter dedication to God's known will. That gives strength and victory. If you don't give total abandonment, you don't get total victory. Settlers, giving themselves to God to a degree or a point, I can only give you so much, Lord. And I've seen this in churches many, many times. Settlers, single-minded, unafraid of making mistakes, they're doers, not merely thinkers or teachers. What if you make a mistake, guys? It's got up, it's got up there with a the big stick. It got up there with a big stick. No. The man who never made a mistake never made anything. Or woman. Settlers, double-minded, afraid of making mistakes, stifled, not many actions. They're what-if people. But what if? What if we do this and it doesn't work? Well, get the mind of Christ. And he'll tell you what to do, and it works. Amen? Amen. 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 Number four, united kingdom language, or using kingdom language, moving on, devotion to Jesus, obedience to his word, heartfelt worship, like we've had this morning, serving others, God rules in all their affairs, sharing with others. Number four, in the settlers, using church language, meetings, services, tradition, constitution, it can't be done. That's a settler, can't be done. Who says, could Goliath be killed by David, a little ruddy youth with a stone? That, Goliath was dead before the stone hit him. Number five, pioneers are unpredictable but reliable, unconcerned about class and only cautious when it serves God's purposes. Settlers. Predictable, precise, with tenth-rate issues. When I first got saved in the Assemblies of God Church, we had a, we had a, a, a meet. Um, what do they call them? Their meetings in um, Baptist, no, no, like a like a when everybody met in the church and they want to talk about things. And people were talking about what colour to paint the bike shed. Uh. I'm thinking if we're talking about people going to hell, why don't we get people out of hell and get them into the kingdom? See, third rate is tenth rate issues. Number six, eternal life enjoyed, explored, and truth released. There is truth released in this place. Number six in, in the settlers, eternal life to be safeguarded and truth defended. We don't have to protect God. He's pretty big enough to protect himself. Number seven, Pioneers, no static concept of God, having only a living relationship. God is seen as gracious, not American or English. You know, I thought about Adam and Eve yesterday. Did Adam and Eve go to heaven to meet God? No. What happened? God came down to meet them. And God comes down to meet us. And he's going to meet you right where you're at. John, what you said, what you said about come as you are. Yeah. He meets you right where you are. Be good. Amen? Amen. The concept of God for a settler is a perfect gent who never raises his voice, never interrupts, plans already made. Oh, but we've we've planned this, so what? God might want to change it. Yeah. Yeah. God might want to change it. We we were talking about dancing with Liana. We were in the States and, and we were in this big meeting and worship was absolutely awesome. Lynn and I got up, started jiving. We jived all over. And all of a sudden, all the people come out, all the men and women, come, and the whole place just erupted. Liana would have liked that. <laughs> but why not? People dance in the world, don't they? Why can't we dance? When I got saved, we were dancing all the time. We are doing the Pentecostal two-step. It's the way I don't know if I can do it now. I'm getting a bit off, but hey, no, 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 chicken. Oh, you well to dance. You're right, country. Age is just a number. Num settlers, number eight, Holy Spirit is talked about in a vague, sentimental way, not expected to do anything or show up. Referred to when nobody knows what to do. Holy Spirit, come. Hang on a minute, we brought him in. Galatians 2.20 says, it's no longer I live in, but Christ, Christos, Holy Spirit, living in me. 
We bring him in. What do you want to call him down for? He's already in. I went into, uh, I, took, I took a couple to a big, a big meal many years ago. And there was a bit of singing going on and stuff like that. And the, the mayor bought me a glass of wine. Lynn had a glass of wine. I'm not advocating anybody drinking, but we had a glass of wine. And this couple who were with us, they were drinking Coca-Cola. And they said, the Holy Spirit wouldn't be in here. I said, don't be stupid, we brought him in. That's people's concept of the Holy Spirit is wrong. He's not a little white bird. He is God, the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 He's part of the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Anyway, that's, that's a byproduct. I'm going to talk in Nehemiah today. I think, didn't you minister on Nehemiah some months ago? Yeah. I, I, I watch everything you do on thing. But Nehemiah, if you turn to Nehemiah chapter 1, I'm going to ask Lynn to give me a couple of examples. She's going to read a couple of examples for me in a minute. But uh, have you given them little maps out? You didn't tell me to. Okay, can you give the little maps out? Little maps of the ten gates mm -hmm. and walls and gates in Jerusalem. And I'll be as quick as I can because I know Wendy wants to get to Karma's meal. <laughs> Nehemiah chapter 1. I think it's only 15, so couples can probably share them. Thank you. Let's speed things up a bit. In Nehemiah 1, he says, um, they came to Nehemiah and, and he says, how are the people in Jerusalem? He said, oh, it's bad, really bad. All the walls are uh, knocked down, all the gates are burned. It's in a real bad way. So Nehemiah, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then I said, Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer your servant is praying before you today. See, Nehemiah was in anguish. When, when we pray for things, have you ever been in anguish over something? Well, no, I just pray for him. See, Nehemiah was in anguish. And he had a good job. He was cupbearer to the king. He had all the king's food. He had the king's drink. Lived in the palace. He had a great job. What a cushy number. But he was in anguish over Jerusalem. And he said, I'm going to speed up a bit because I've talked too much. But... Never. It always happens to me, doesn't it? Always. <laughs> You know, I was in a church in Liverpool once, in a rough area, really rough area, preaching on a Wednesday night. And I'm in the middle of my sermon, and a guy got up. He starts shouting at me. I said, excuse me, sir, 10 years ago, before I was saved, I'd come down here by you and put you in hospital. <laughs> now shut up and give the word of God the, the what it deserves. He went, <laughs> and he came to me afterwards and he bothered you. But, you know, I'm thinking, don't, don't mess around with the word of God. Is that, is that, is that right then? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about Nehemiah said to the king, the king says, what do you want? He said, I want to go back and make me sort of uh, over this project, go back and build the gates and the walls and everything else in Jerusalem. And the king says, okay. He said, well, give me letters steadily through safely and let me go and get some wood, some timber from this other guy. And he's going to give me the wood for the gates and the doors and everything else. And Nehemiah goes back um, and he starts to build the walls. I've got to say to you, everybody who built the walls in Jerusalem were volunteers. And everybody who built the walls, it wasn't their job. Well, it's not my job. Well, sorry, uh, you know, I, I can't do dancing like the armor. I mean, it's not my job. Hey, guess what? Guess what your job is, whatever God says your job is. Everybody there were volunteers. And in the end of the, of the passage, it says that God recorded all the names of all the people that did the work. And everything we do is recorded in heaven. You know, the scripture says that Jesus knew 
what they were thinking in their hearts, not their heads. See, God knows what you're even thinking in your heart. So be careful, Carmen. Oh, I will. Yes. Okay. He knows everything. You're sure. Yeah. yeah. You've got your maps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. They're the ten gates. These walls and the gates were repaired. They were finished in 52 days. I mean, who could have done that? Even quality stonemasons, quality repairers and bricklayers and everything else, I don't think they could have done it in 52 days, but there was a perfumier. He did it, got his hands dirty with the trowel. There was a, there was a, a, a silversmith, a goldsmith, and they worked. It's not my job. Your job is to preach the gospel. Going into all the world and what? Tell people we want to get them into heaven. No, we want to get heaven into people. Mm. Everybody wants their heaven ticket. There's going to be a lot of disappointed people. You know, that, that's not, I'm not the judge, so it's nothing to do. But everything all right, guys? Yeah. All right. I'm going to explain what the gates are to you because I don't know if you've ever seen this, but. The gates really mean something. Ten gates in Jerusalem. The first one that mentioned is the Sheep Gate. The very first gate mentioned the Sheep Gate. It was called the Sheep Gate because this was the gate which the sheep and lambs used in the sacrifice were brought with. No prizes for knowing that this speaks of the very first experience we come into in our Christian life. That is a realisation that Jesus was the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. The sheep gate then speaks to us of the cross and the sacrifice that was made for our sins. It is the starting point of everything, but you will also notice that if you read the entire chapter, that the sheep gate is also mentioned at the very end once we have come full circle. That's because everything starts and ends with Jesus. Then just read that thing. See, the people were working in there, we're all volunteers, but just read a couple of them things. This is, this is really crucial. It's in Nehemiah 3, verse 5, he's looking for us. It's the next section is repaired by the men of Tishkoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. See, I'm a noble. You know, I, I, can't, uh, I can't do any bricklaying because I'm special. You know, I, I, can't, uh, you know, I can't go dancing down the, you know, we're, we're special, you know. See, the nobles, they won't put their hands to them. But you see, we're, God's looking for people who are humble, who are willing to do what he says do. Well, is it gone quiet? No. no. Oh, good. Right. Do you know, I mean, can't be quiet. Can't be quiet for Moses. No. The next gate is mentioned. Uh, sorry, what's the other thing? Read the other yeah, read the other thing then. This is in verse 12 of Nehemiah. Nehemiah 3. This is, we like this. Shalom. Son of Hanahesh, ruler of half district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the health of his daughters. Yeah. It wasn't just the men. You've got to make make the women did it as well. Oh well, it's not. No, it's not a man thing. Sorry, it's an all thing. Yes. When they talked, um, when they talked about uh, many places in the Bible, said they all came out as one. Does that say just men? No. no. Jesus was the great emancipator of women. Yeah. It's true. Mm -hmm. yeah. hey. um, everybody, especially in, in the Old Testaments and stuff, it was always the women were nobodies. They were nothing. And even in this country, women couldn't vote until, I don't know, how many years ago. But, but it was, it's not just the men, it's everybody. Even the daughters. So the kids were helping as well. Is that good? Yes. All right, girls? Amen. Great. Next gate is the fish gate. That was next to be mentioned. It was called the fish gate because the fishermen of Galilee would bring their catch in through this gate to be sold. For it speaks of evangelism. Sure, evangelism. As we have been called to be fishers of men, it's natural progression in our Christian life that after seeing that Jesus dies for our sins, that we would want to tell others about it. Every survey has shown that believers who have been saved less than two years Win the most people to the Lord. That's really weird, isn't it? 
Servants of the first two years you get saved, you, you are on fire. You're electric. But then all of a sudden you must calm down. Hey, I don't want to calm down. I'm never going to retire. I'm going to refire. Sorry, that I've, I've retired. Yeah, I'm on pension, but I'm not retired. I am refiring. I want more of God. And I want to see God do more. Amen. Amen. Sorry. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. The next gate is the old gate or the Jeshaniah gate. Let's call it the old gate because it's easier than Jeshaniah. See, it's not about religion. It's about knowing God's ways. Sure, why does it always happen to me? Details. They have special needs, you know. <laughs> it's not religion, it's knowing God's ways. We read that scripture last week, didn't we? Where was it then? About knowing God's ways. When Moses said to God, Teach me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your ways. God's grace. Sorry? Psalm 103. Uh, that's when he says, he, he showed his ways to Moses, but, he, but there's another scripture that we read. I think it was from Ecclesiastes, wasn't it? Um, the old gate was next and speaks to us of the old ways of truth. A young Christian having experienced the sheep gate, then the fish gate, soon sees a need for experience the old gate. You've got to know God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen? Amen. So the old ways, oh, well, well we don't want to do it like, you know, that is, that's, a bit, that's a bit boring. But you see, God's never boring. God is a contemporary God, and he wants, he wants change. Change is here to stay. So the old gate talks about the principles of God, the principles that we've got to live. We've got to run church by principles. We can't have a free-for-all in church. Yeah, we can have a good time. We can dance. We can, we, can, we can be very exuberant in church. But there are the old ways where God says, this is the way it should be. In Ezekiel, it talks about the protocol in church. And there is a protocol. Um, you wouldn't go into the Anglican church and shout out, go and get a coffee during, during the preacher or anything else, would you? You wouldn't do it in the Catholic church, would you, Sean? Yeah, yeah but, but in, in other churches like ours, which is pretty free and open, and that's how we want it. But sometimes we have to realise there is a protocol, there's a way of doing things that, that keeps things decently and in order. I know, I know people don't like that. Oh, decently in order. No, it's just it's to do with honour. Do you want to honour God? Do you want to honour the man of God? Right. I want to honour the man of God. And that's the way we should be. So the old gate, really important. Then there's the valley gate. Examining the picture above, notice that there is a long distance between, between the next gate, which is the valley gate. See, when you've been saved for a while, like me, I got saved and... I was seeing miracle after miracle. I'm thinking, wow, this is brilliant. Nothing's ever going to go wrong. This is great. Yeah. <laughs> and all of a sudden you get to the valley gate and you're in the valleys. But there's no, no food on the mountaintops. The food is in the valley. It's where you're fed and you feed and you feed and you cry out to God and you lay before God and you lay everything out before him in, in, in the valleys. Examining the picture, that you'll see there's a long distance. Uh, allow the honeymoon period, which he teaches you, his presence is strong in your life. This can go on for some time, as indicated by position of the old and the valley gates. But sooner or later, the valley gate must come. The valley gate speaks to us of humbling and trials. I'm proud to be humble. <laughs> it's a humbling experience sometimes when you find out where you really are. Because when I got saved, I just wanted everything, and I wanted to know everything, and I read everything, and I would read book after book. Now I don't read many books, because I don't know who's written them. So I'm very careful in what I read. I want to I want to read books from people I trust, from people who are doing it in the kingdom, have done it in the kingdom, uh, and they're, they're the people I trust, and they're the people I want to read through. But you see, there comes a time that, that these, these valleys come 
and they're not they're not easy they're not easy you go through some stuff but then the next gate is the dung gate did you notice it's right at the bottom you're yeah, looking at your map the, the dung gate, refuse gate. Again, there is quite a distance to the next gate, indicating that unfortunately the valley gate experience can carry on for some time, but the result that experience is clearly seen in the next gate, the dung gate. This is the gate that they would take all the refuse and rubbish out of Jerusalem. Last year, God woke me up in the middle of the night and he said, he said this to me, he said, it's time to take out the trash. And I said, what are you on about, look? And I'm like, what are you on about? Because he does this to me. Like he got me, he, he woke me up this week in the, middle, in the middle of the night. And he's showing me this man that I know, a pastor over at um, New Leeds. And, and I was looking at him, and he's a good guy. And, and, and God said to me, go over and tell him he's an apostle. I said, what are you on about? He said, go and tell him he's an apostle. So... In the dream, I went over to him, but I phoned him up the next day and told him, the guy's sobbing on the phone. God does this to me. I don't know why. I'm, not, I'm nothing special, but uh, somehow I can I tune into God. Normally when I sleep, because it's the only time he can get me quiet. Does that make sense? Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah. I'll take a nap. No comment. So I said, what's an apostle? Perhaps it's not a big shot, you know. He's not a big shot. An apostle is one who is sent. One who is sent. That's that's the that's what it means. And this guy, he said, he said, I'm sorry, but I'm weeping. He said, I'm weeping on the phone. And then he texts me back later on. He said, can you write it down? Can you send it to me, what God actually said to you? And I sent it all to him. And it's unbelievable. This guy's Australian. God sent him from Australia to England. England needs missionaries. We don't need to be sending any missionaries. We need them here. Yeah. What's going on? So this is the gate that would take all the refuse rubbish out of Jerusalem down to the valley to be burned. God says, take out the trash. So I said, God, what do you mean? He says, Acts 28, the apostle Paul shipwrecked. He's going to be shipwrecked. God tells him, ship's going to go. He says, chuck everything overboard you don't need. Cut the ropes of the rudders. Cut the ropes of the anchors. Because the rudders, then you don't know where you're going. You cut the ropes on the anchors. It can't hold you back. You're going to go where God takes you. And he says, take out the rubbish. Take, get rid of everything you don't need. And in a church, you should get rid of everything you don't need. Because there's things we do. Well, we've always done it like that. I could go into some churches, you're going to get four fast ones, two slow ones, Bible reading, then a testimony, then this. Then you know exactly what's going to happen every Sunday. I'm, I want to go in. I don't know what's going to happen. What's God going to do? We want God to do things, don't we? Amen. Right, Sean? You right, mate? Clear away the rubbish so that our true faith can show through, refined by fire, can come forth and produce fruit. Clearing away the rubbish in our lives is never easy, but the benefits of this experience can be seen in the next gate, which is the fountain gate. The fountain gate. You will notice from the picture that the family gate is located extremely close to the dung gate. In other words, after the valley gate experience, where rubbish in our life is cleared out, true faith comes forth and the fountains begin to flow. Amen. Father, we want the fountains to flow in this place, fountains to flow in the people in this place, Lord, that the, the fountains of God will just flow in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Um, it doesn't take long. This speaks to us of living waters of the Holy Spirit that cleanse our lives, empower us for our Christian walk. Next gate is the water gate. We arrive at the water gate. is the picture, I believe, the word of God and its effect in our life. Ephesians 5.26 says, having washed her by the water of the word. No coincidence that this gate was located next to the fountain gate as the two often go together. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes the word of God alive to us, personally allowing cleansing, encouragement and direction to take place. Next one is the horse gate. Speaks to us of warfare. See, there's going to come some warfare. When Nehemiah was building all these gates and walls, there was three arrows, Sambalat, Tobiah and Geshem. And they were all against the building. They did everything to thwart the, the building of the walls. They did everything, these three arrows. They, they tried everything to stop it. 
They said, oh, you know, we can get over those walls. Fox, little foxes can get in there. And, and, and it says in the word there, that in Nehemiah 3, it said that Nehemiah kept the watchman close by him at all times with the trumpet. See, if every uh, builder has got somebody there blowing the trumpet saying, whoa, we've got a problem here, we've got to deal with that. And, 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 and the Arabs are wanting to take us off the wall. Well, that church is rubbish. This church is no good. You know, you're not doing much. Says what? What does God say? God said, I've got a cornerstone and I'm building and I want people who are volunteers. Right, John? Volunteers. Amen. Amen. Next gate after the horse gate is the east gate. The east gate has been set aside especially by God and was known by the Jews for one particular event, the coming of the Messiah. Ezekiel 44, 1-3, the gate that looked towards the east, it was shut. The Lord said to me, this gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened and no one shall enter by it, for the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. The east gate opens and looks towards Mount of Olives. And we know that when Jesus returns, he will return to this mount. I'm, I'm moving on quickly because of time. But then there's the inspection gate. The final gate is the inspection gate. Speaks to us of the beamer seat of Christ, where our lives are inspected and rewarded appropriately in our Christian experience. We should be living with this in mind. We are called to live our lives with eternity in view. Caring more for the things of eternity than the temporal that we see around us. Prophetically, this gate also speaks of the judgment of the nations that takes place when Jesus returns. We're waiting for Christ to come back. Because it's, it says there, um, Ephesians 4.11, he gave some. See, it was team effort. Team effort. God gave some to be bricklayers, stone layers. Oh, that's not my job. Um, I, 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 I can't do that. Who says? There's nothing you can't do. Lynn says things like that. You can't. I said, the word is not can't. The word is won't. Then, then she gives me an ear. But it's not. There's nothing we can't do in God. For God. There was a, a great man of God in Bradford who had a big church and he preached this message. He said, it's not about us. It's about the others. It ain't about us in here. It's about them out there who are going to hell. How many people in crew are going to hell? Not quite a lot. Not a lot. Quite a lot. Generally. And it's about the others. That's what we're looking to. We want, we want people coming in and knowing the power of God. But unless, see, only saved people save people. I know God saves them, but only saved people get them into the kingdom. Not somebody who talks about it, spouts off and quotes a few scriptures. Anybody can quote a few scriptures. The devil can quote many scriptures. He did it to Jesus. So we want people who know what the word of God says. We know what God says. You've got to be tuned into what God wants. How about God waking you up in the middle of the night and giving you a word? Oh, well, that's a bit heavy. You can't disturb my sleep. I want God to wake me up any time he wants to wake me up. Yeah. see the liars and the attitudes of the workers there are a few more important points we can come out of this chapter like uh, that we have it's a team effort I think the first thing we see the whole process is a team effort there's one man running it that's Nehemiah he's got his watchman with him on the wall with a trumpet that's great but then everybody else Except the nobles wouldn't do it. You know, because we're noble. What were the Pharisees like? Who's the only people Jesus did not get on with? Pharisees. Pharisees. Yeah. I wrote in my Bible, it's in my Bible. I said, uh, Pharisees are still, this was 1997. There's still Pharisees in the church today. Yeah. And there are. Mm -hmm. They really are. They wear ties. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, sorry, John. Oh, it says there that uh, in Ephesians 4 11, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Why? So they can be, I'm a noble, I'm somebody. No, for the equipping of the saints. 
so they can teach the people what God wants them to know. God's always spoke through one man normally. You know, he spoke through Abraham. He spoke through Moses. He spoke through many great men of God. Did that make them super duper? You see, people say, well, Moses didn't even get into the promised land. Yes, he did. On the Mount of Transfiguration. He was there with Elijah. Brilliant. But they also, oh, Moses did. And David committed adultery. Oh, yeah. But Bathsheba's in the lineage, Matthew 1. Bathsheba's men. Come on, guys. You know, we, we're not here to judge. We're not here to judge anybody. We're here to love everybody. And we're here to see people come into the kingdom. Amen. Amen. But, but it's, a, it's an all job. Everybody's got to do their bit. Yeah. And that's tough because there's not a lot of us, is there? No. So that means we've all got to work quite hard. Which Stephen said, yes. Well done, Steve. It says there that um, the saints are a work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of faith. It's not unity of the doctrine. It's unity of the faith. See, many, oh, we don't agree. We don't, we're not the same doctrine as you. We ain't got to come into the uh, unity of the doctrine. It's the unity of the faith. As long as you've got faith in God and believe he can do what he says he can. And we believe we can do what we can do. See, we sung a song this morning about God can move mountains. Did you all see that? Yeah. God can move mountains. But don't be surprised if he gives you a shovel. Because <laughs> we got our bit to do. Amen. I like, I like that one. <laughs> And let me tell you something, everybody has got something to offer, including Mo. Um, everybody's got something to offer. Because it is an all thing. Now it's gone. You will notice that the giftings that people have are for the equipping of the saints in their work of service. That's what we learn from Nehemiah. Some may have been gifted in particular areas and they work in these areas, but all helped whatever way they could. Everyone, everybody in here has got something to offer. Uh, and you. Um, <laughs> keep that. Yeah. Maybe you're unsure of your gifting and what God is calling you to do with your life. Maybe you don't think you have anything to offer. Get on your knees and say, God, what would you have me to do? Oh, well, uh, God's not asking you to do what you can do. He's asking you what he wants you to do. See, I'm sure that perfume here, and he didn't want to get his hands messed up, did he? Doing bricklaying. But it said when they were bricklaying, they had a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other hand. <laughs> because just in case anybody is that. We've got to be on our guard and protect the people of this folly because they, they want to be attacked. Things come against you. So they had a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other hand to build. No one got paid or even coerced into rebuilding the walls. Everybody volunteered. I love that. And everybody said, what, what can I do? Well, well, I can't get up very early, Sean. You know, you know I, can't, I, I can't come for a six o'clock prayer meeting. When I went to the States, I moved there. I used to go to the five o'clock prayer meeting every morning. And I used to drive 10 miles to get it. It's not that you can't, it's that you won't. And uh, there are certain things that we have to do. Like people say, well, uh, fast, fast me pray. How about praying faster? <coughs> I quite like that. <laughs> Prayer and fasting, what about? Pray faster. Yeah. See, fasting is great, but it means giving up something. It means you're sacrificing something to get, get something from God. I know a guy who fasted 40 days and 40 nights in America. He's one of the elders in the church. And uh, he, had, he had to come off, he had to come back on food, like just with milk and, and liquids and stuff. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not good for the body to fast for 40 days. So don't say, oh, I'm fasting 40 days. You know, you do it for a week and you'll die. <laughs> not die physically, but yeah. it'll, it'll be tough, won't it? Um, but fasting is good. It means I'm going to, perhaps I'll give up television for a week. Whoa! Hang on a minute. Whoa! Uh, that's, no, that's too tough. I can't do that. Well, I watch Christian programs. Really? So what? Really? <laughs> oh. 
You are Tommy. At the end of that, it says that God recorded everybody's name who did the work. And I want to tell you, God, God is a recorder of names. I heard a great man of God say this once. He said, anything you do in an attempt to please God or obey God, even if it's wrong, will not go unrewarded. Can't think, hang on a sec. Yeah, but it doesn't matter if you make a mistake, as long as you try. As long as you, as long as you got out there and danced yesterday, it was brilliant. Or whenever it was, Saturday. <laughs> As long as you get up and do something, God says, Well, wow, must it? It's not that they get back bit. <laughs> because people are willing to do something. It's too many people sitting in church, just no. well, they know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. They put their pound in the offering. Yeah, the ball, and then. God says, You know, um, I want all of you. I want all of you. I don't just want a pound. I want all of you. And not, I don't want your money, but I want all of you. Mm-hmm. And if you've got all of you, he's got everything. Amen. Amen. I second so, that. She seconds that. We're all right. <laughs> I mean, it's good. <laughs> so uh, take those take those maps home with you and just think about the things I've said. If you want a copy of all the, the talking, what each gate means, I can do those for you and let you have um, And think about the uh, pioneers and settlers. Are you a pioneer or are you a settler? See, you got. I'm not asking you a question. You ask yourself. Am I, am I somebody who says, what if? Or I say, let's do it. Let's kick a door down. Let's, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's just go and do it. Do it. Just do it. What is, Peter's in prison, Acts 12. He's got shackles on his wrists, on his legs and everywhere. 16 guards there. And an angel gives him a slap. An angel gives him a slap, so be careful. Oh. Oh. What? Yet? An angel gives him a slap and says, get up. And it's time, the, it's time the church got up and started doing something. When he got up, the chains fell off, the gates opened, and guess what happened? Acts chapter 2, you read what happened, don't you? You know, God came down and the Holy Spirit fell in power, fire and power, and things started to happen. We want to see things happen in the church. I want to see people healed. I want to see people delivered. You know, you do realise there are... Jesus made a statement. He said to the 72, I'm sending you out with all authority to cast out demons and heal the sick. We only talk about healing the sick. People don't want to talk about demons. And I'm not a demon chaser. But when something arises, you have to deal with it. Now, if someone's breaking in your house and wanting to do harm to your family, what would you do? Get him with something. <laughs> yeah, I've got a hammer by my bed. <laughs> Somebody breaks, in, breaks into your house and do something and someone's trying to break into this house, you have to do something about it. I'll tell you some stories some days about how we've been attacked and things that have happened, but you can, you can, you can, you've you got Jesus Christ in your life. If you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour, then we want to talk to you afterwards. Because we want, we want people to come to Christ and be living with that knowledge that Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. I know he does. He loves me. I know you. This one was done it, yeah. Jesus, don't about. Jesus loves you. That's good. No, yeah. And and he wants to love on us, really love on us, but he wants us to do what he wants us to do. Oh, I don't feel like it. Mm. What happened if if you went home and, and oh you you're the cook? Eh? If I went home and my wife says I'm not cooking today, I think oh dear, no, that's bad. I don't <laughs> feel like it. <laughs> I think we're proper drop to the pub then as well. <laughs> you understand, it's not, I don't feel like it. It's, come on, this is God. God sent his son, his only son, to die on that for you and me. I'm not, oh, Sammy. You see what he did for us? Guess what? That's what we're going to do for him. So remember those, remember the gates. I've, I've, I've done it as quick as I could, but it, it, it's, it should have done it as a Bible study, really. They're beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> But let me tell you, volunteers, <laughs> got to remember that bit. Nobody got coerced, nobody got paid, but it was all volunteers where they said, we want to do what we can for the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and that's what they did. And they did it in 52 days. I like that. Amen. So, Father, I just thank you, Lord, for the privilege and the honour of being able to share your word. Thank you for your word, Lord, because it is, it is my sword. Lord, and you're my shield. 
And I just pray in Jesus' name, Lord, that these words would mean something to, to, to most of these people, Lord, that they would take it in, that the gates mean something in our Christian war. Now we've come through from the, from the sheep gate to the fish gate, and all the other gates, Lord, the valley gates and the dung gates where we've got rid of the rubbish. And Father, I pray that we would get rid of any rubbish in our life that doesn't meet with your approval, that you don't agree with, that we would say, Lord, I, if you don't want it, I don't need it. So Father, I just pray for us in Jesus' precious name, Lord, that we would be the people of God that you designed us to be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.